I'm going to talk about data for the 99%. Uh, you might ask, what does that mean? The alternative title to this talk is 22 problems that Facebook has that you don't, or face problems you have that Facebook doesn't. Um, so I'll get into what that means in a second. Uh, a little bit of background about myself. Uh, so I am one of the co-founders of Mode. Uh, like Ian said, Mode is a, a collaborative platform for analysts, data scientists, and their organizations. Uh, the original inspiration for Mode came from a lot of internal tools that got built. Oh, I guess I'm kind of standing in the way here. Uh, got came from a lot of internal tools that got built at companies like this, like Facebook and Uber and and LinkedIn and Airbnb and stuff like that. Um, these companies represent what I consider like the one percent of of data companies. They're companies that are at the bleeding edge of data problems. Uh, they're solving problems of really big complexity, really complicated scale. I mean, really big scale, really complicated problems. They're the kinds of companies that actually need to build tools internally and technologies internally to address the problems that they have. Most companies don't actually have these kinds of problems. Uh, and most companies, which I'm referring to here as the 99%, have a very different set of problems. Uh, we sell to these companies. We see a lot of these folks when we're, when we're talking to prospects and talking to our customers. And so we hear a lot about the challenges that they have uh, when they're trying to get their, their sort of data infrastructure, data culture set up. And so they're not actually trying to do things like run real-time prediction algorithms against petabytes of data. Those aren't the problems that they have. They don't have the teams to build internal tools. They don't have the teams to build technologies to solve their problems. They don't even need to do that. Uh, they have much more mundane problems, and, and those are the problems that I want to talk about. Uh, and you may be asking, like, why? Why bother talking about these problems if they're the less interesting ones, uh, especially if they're sort of solved problems? There's a few reasons for it. One is it's useful to break out of the bubble. Um, that to say it in a way that nobody's ever said it before, uh, it's useful to kind of not be in the Silicon Valley bubble in like a data engineering world. Uh, learn more about how data engineering happens in middle America. Uh, we've all kind of seen what happens when San Francisco doesn't get out of San Francisco. The other part is that this is the market. So this 99% doesn't represent small tech startups. This represents Fortune 500 companies as well. It represents the government. It represents companies that are massive, like media companies, massive retail companies, massive commerce companies. Uh, these are all things that, that if you're thinking about open sourcing tools, if you're thinking about building technologies that you want to be widely adopted, if you're thinking about starting a company to, to solve data problems, this is the market you have to address. And these are the kinds of problems that your market will have to be trying to solve. So if, if, if you're working on things that you want to have wide appeal, this is the kinds of problems and kind of ecosystem you'd have to operate in. Uh, finally, a lot of the problems that, that I want to talk through are things that are a blend of cultural and technical problems. Data engineering isn't just a technical problem, it's also a cultural problem, kind of building up the, the right culture around how to use data, what to do with it, how to do analytics. Uh, at mature companies, this still doesn't change. That even the biggest companies, the Facebooks and stuff of the world, they still have cultural problems with how to use data. And we can learn a lot from what companies do when they're at the very beginnings of this kind of cultural transition into taking advantage of their data. So uh, to get started, uh, I have 22 problems I want to talk through and like 20 minutes to get through it. Um, before getting into this, though, I broke this up into a few different sections. Uh, the first section, it, it reminds me of a, a sort of interview that I had back when I was first interviewing for jobs at, uh, before, after college. Um, so I was interviewing for jobs. I went to an interview in DC. I was interviewing for a job at a think tank. The, the first person who interviewed me asked me a question of like, so tell me about your background. Like, what's, what's your story? And so I started being like the simple, temple, typical way you would answer it of just, uh, I went to college here, majored in this, that sort of thing. And he cut me off and he was like, no, no, no. I want to know like your background. Like, where are you from? Where are your parents from? Where were your parents born? Which one, I think it's probably an illegal question to ask. But that part aside, that reaction is actually the reaction I have when we talk to a lot of our potential customers. We ask them, like, what are your data problems? What do you need from a data tool? And they give answers that are like, oh, you want to go that far back. Um, so this part is the know where were your parents born section of data problems that companies encounter. The first one they run into is we aren't ready for analytics. Uh, the temptation, especially as someone trying to sell them a data product, is to say, everybody's ready for analytics. Everybody needs data like analysis and needs data. Uh, at very small companies, this actually may not be true. For people who are just trying to get things off the ground, for people who don't have customers yet, for people who haven't actually 
uh, started serving their market yet, they probably actually don't have a lot of data and they're trying to move faster than, than they're trying to make decisions based on intuition. They need to move very quickly. And there are cases in which people actually shouldn't be ready to do analytics. They should be focused on other parts of building their business. That said, there's a slightly different answer to this that is a much more uh, pernicious answer, which is we aren't ready to do analytics right. We hear this a lot from other folks as well. It typically happens after they read some Medium blog post or something about this is the ideal data stack. Uh, this is all the tools you need to, to really do analytics correctly. They'll say things like, we don't know what to track. Uh, we, don't, oops, we don't track the right things. We don't know what our metrics are. All of these things suffer from the same problem, which is they're making analytics, for analytics, they're making the perfect the enemy of the good. Um, a lot of companies at this stage think that that we have to build out an entire infrastructure, we have to have a perfect plan for how to do things before we can actually start, start working on, on our analysis and our data science. And, and in this case, this actually isn't right. A lot of the stuff that, that analytics can do can operate really well on imperfect data. Some of the decisions we made very early on at Mode weren't based on perfect numbers, they weren't based on data that we knew was perfectly clean, but they helped us understand like, how people were using our product at a very basic level and allowed us to make better decisions early on. There are also things where this is, this sort of misunderstands some of the values of analytics. Um, analytics isn't about defining a perfect metric and then chasing that perfect metric. It's not about you targeting something that is a fixed location. Analytics changes. What you need out of analytics and what you need out of, out of data is constantly changing as your business is changing. And so you never have such thing as a right metric. You'll never actually figure out your metrics. It's something that has to evolve as your business evolves. And you should start chasing it as soon as you can. So once you answer these questions, these are kind of the cultural things that I mentioned or the early stage cultural things. Once you get past this stage, you actually move on to things that are real data engineering problems. Um, and so at this point, a lot of folks that come to us will be people who've implemented basic tools like Google Analytics or Mixpanel or things like that. And then they're looking to take it further. And so the first problem they often run into is they can't query their data. Um, they have Google Analytics. They, they're constrained by what Google Analytics lets them do, they have questions that go beyond what Google Analytics lets them do, and they're not sure where to go next. Fortunately, this is a very solved problem. There's a bunch of tools out there now that let you do this very easily. Google Analytics, in fact, lets you dump your data directly into BigQuery. Uh, these other tools all allow you to pipe data into, into these basic drag and drop kind of analytics tools, as well as dump the data into a database and make it easy to query. All of these things you can do in a few clicks. So this is a problem now that's, that's thankfully solved by a lot of the great companies out there. As soon as you do this, though, people will start realizing there's another problem, which is they have data all over the place. It's not just they have web tracking data. They have data in a bunch of warehouses. They have data in third party tools like Salesforce or Marketo or Zendesk. All of this data is really important to their business, and they need to be able to query all that as well. This is a partially solved problem. These same tools, there's a whole bunch of these tools uh, that, that will do a really good job of pulling data out of third-party tools into data warehouses for you to work on. So tools like Segment, Fivetran, uh, Stitch, Etleap, these are all really good tools at saying, let's just mirror my Salesforce instance into a warehouse and I can query it immediately. That's great. And this is something that used to be a really hard problem. Uh, I used to work at a company that we tried to do this. We had an engineering team that focused on just pulling data from a couple of third party sources. And now it's something you can again do with just a few clicks. Um, one place where this actually does get a little trickier is if you're trying to move data between databases. Uh, it works pretty well on top of a modern stack if you're using something like Redshift. It doesn't work so well on top of like legacy vendors. So if you're using Oracle or you're using something like SAP, uh, a lot of these tools don't actually operate particularly well on those things. So if you're looking for places to, to solve problems that people haven't yet solved, building the kind of modern stack for sort of more legacy vendors is something that's still, still a thing that people struggle with. Of course, once you see this list, this excuse me, leads to another problem of which of these tools do I actually choose? Uh, how do I pick an ETL tool? How do I even, maybe I don't want one of these, maybe I want to build it myself. Um, there's a lot of things that go into that. There's a lot of, of variables that may help you decide what you want to do. I don't want to get into that too much. You all probably understand that better than I do. One thing I think that's really important to consider though is that when you're thinking about an ETL tool and thinking about an ETL tool that you're building versus an ETL tool you're buying, the, the important part of it is the surface area of that tool is the data that comes out the other side. 
it's easy to look at one of these tools and think which one has the shiniest application, which one has great dashboards to help you monitor it. That's not the way you interact with these things on a day-to-day -day basis. You interact with these things by querying the data. And if the data is no good, then the tool's no good, regardless of how kind of sexy the application might be. So once you get to this place, uh, now you're, you've got data, you've got a culture that cares about the data, great. What happens next? This is the part when analysts start to complain. Uh, you now have analysts working with the data, and they're, they're, you now have to deal with the, the actual issues of how do you analyze this. The first complaint people typically have is our queries are slow. Um, this typically happens when people are working on top of data that is on production systems or in replica databases or things like that. This happens when you first start querying data. Uh, in this case, people are using like MySQL databases or Postgres, or sometimes if you've done something crazy three years ago, you might be using something like Mongo. While these databases are all good, they can be slow. You hit limits pretty quickly. Uh, this is a pretty straightforward solution. Again, pipe your data into, into an analytical warehouse that, that will uh, that'll take care of a lot of that for you. There's a lot of options for that now, a lot of cloud-based options as well, which are very easy to manage. Uh, Redshift and BigQuery are the two that we see the most often that are very popular these days, but there's a bunch of other things as well uh, that you can do. There's also some things that aren't on this list, like Spark. Uh, I didn't put that up here mainly because the logo wasn't blue. Um, but uh, there's a lot of options for this. This is, again, something that's a very solved problem of if you're working on, on a database, an open source database like, like Postgres or MySQL, you have much faster things to, to quickly scale your queries. That again, though, if you see another list of things, it's like, how do we choose which one of these to get into? How do we invest, choose which database to invest in? Uh, I certainly am not going to go into the technology of these things and which one's faster and do any sort of benchmarking on those things. Uh, that's not my expertise by any means. I think, though, one thing that's really important to think about, particularly in this 99% ecosystem, is the way that a lot of these folks make this decision isn't on the sort of technical specs of these, of these types of tools. That to, to a lot of these companies, all of these databases are Ferraris that you're driving down the highway. You can't actually take them as fast as you need to take them. The way that a lot of people make these decisions is on the ecosystems that are around them. One of the reasons that Redshift has been really successful is because there's this massive ecosystem of tools around it now. There's a bunch of ETL tools, there's a bunch of analytics tools. Uh, you don't get that if you use something like Snowflake, which is also a really good piece of technology, but doesn't quite have the same support that a tool like uh, Redshift currently has. And so when, when folks are thinking about buying these tools these days, this kind of ecosystem is really what matters as much as the tech specs do themselves. So uh, once you've got a data warehouse, you may be working in Redshift or whatever, and things like that, all's good. That's when you run into your next problem, which is my queries are slow again. This is a point at which we see a lot of companies want to engineer a solution. They want to do something like, we'll do some fancy partitioning, we'll manage our sort keys more actively, we'll do a bunch of stuff to make our queries more efficient, we'll demand our analysts write better queries. For most companies, when you first see this problem again, don't do that. Throw money at the problem. Uh, just buy a bigger Redshift database. Buy a bigger BigQuery instance. The Mode is a company that's a few years old. It's a data company. We collect a lot of data. We're a tech company and a, and a web company, so we collect a lot of web data. We spend a few thousand dollars a month on Redshift, and it scales really well for us. We also write a lot of queries because we're, again, a data company. Uh, that works out to being thirty to $40,000 a year. That's way less than we would pay a data engineer to manage this stuff. Uh, and so it's, it's way, like, we also can do it in a click of a button. We can just say, we want more Redshift or we want our queries to run faster. We go to the console and 15 minutes later we've got it done. If we wanted to try to engineer a solution for this problem, it's something that would take us months to even get anything off the ground and it's not clear that it actually even work any better. That said, uh, even when you do that, the next problem you run into is your queries are slow again. Uh, even after you have some big database, you spend a bunch of money on it, there are points in which it becomes prohibitively expensive to buy more. Uh, this is when the problem actually gets hard. Uh, there's a few options you have here. One is to do some of the stuff I described before about actually engineering solutions and making your queries more efficient and things like that. That can work, and it can work, again, kind of at the very top of this problem. Uh, and companies like Facebook probably do have to do those sorts of things. For most companies, again, and most of the companies we talk to, that's a, it's a tempting option, but it's like maintaining really good documentation. It's something that doesn't actually happen that well, and basing your entire solution on we're going to be really well documented usually doesn't actually work out. 
A second option is to, to look for different database technologies. There are things that can be much faster and scale much bigger than, than some of the things that were shown before. Uh, that can work for folks. It depends, again, on kind of how technically competent uh, your team is and how much you're willing to invest in, in maintaining a little bit more of an esoteric thing than something like Redshift, which you can maintain very easily. The, the third solution to this, and this is, this is my preferred solution, is helping build like aggregated views of things in your database. A lot of what is done in your database is done for the sake of, of analysis. It's done for the sake of analysts being able to write queries and understand things. Uh, a lot of times those analysts don't need to query things like raw event streams or don't need to query terabytes of data at once. You can aggregate that up. You can do it in such a way that analysts can get the answers they want, but operating on much smaller data sets. Uh, this is a problem that helps with the scaling, a solution that helps with the scaling problem, as well as making your analysts more efficient, whereas doing things like query optimization doesn't actually make your analysts more efficient. And if all of this data is collected for the sake of your analysts, then having this other solution that solves a couple problems at once, to me, is something that makes a lot more sense. That then, though, raises a problem of, okay, now I have to build data pipelines. These data pipelines are expensive to maintain. How do I do that? Uh, fortunately, there's another list of tools for this. Um, so a lot of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Snow. Uh, I mean, with uh, Airflow. Uh, Airflow's Airbnb's open source version of, of this. It allows you to build data pipelines and things like that for, for exactly this purpose. Um, Aluma is another tool that does this. Uh, AWS has recently launched a couple things that are still in beta to solve these same problems. These are all Python-based tools, or primarily Python-based tools. Uh, of, AWS has a bit more flexibility there, but they're mostly things aimed at aimed at Python developers. Um, that works pretty well. Xplenty is a version of this that you can do in drag and drop. Drag and drop has pros and cons in a lot of ways here. I tend to believe it's more of a con for the types of things you want to do, but for some folks that works. Uh, though my, my ultimately the place that I have a fairly strong opinion here is if you're building these sorts of pipelines and these sorts of aggregations, those are things that should be built by analysts. Analysts are often the consumers of them. If you're relying on engineers to build all of these pipelines, then you're adding a lot of extra friction to the process of getting that done. And so if analysts are building it, uh, it's typically best, especially at these like 99% companies, to do it in something like SQL. Um, and and SQL-based tools are things that are much more widely adopted, much better known than Python at a lot of these companies. And so there are some open source tools. DBT is an open source tool that allows you to build these pipelines in SQL. That practice and that, that kind of methodology is something that I'm, I'm like very supportive of and think is a really good solution for this. Another question you run into uh, once you have data in all these places is how do you actually choose an analytics tool? Uh, this one's really easy. You go to modeanalytics.com, click get started and follow the directions from there. Uh, all right, so uh, once you do this, you've got hard problems to solve. Now you have data, you've got tools in place, you've got analytics tools, you could buy something other than mode, I don't know why you would, but you could. Um, all your stuff is in place, and now you have to actually solve problems that are the needs of the business. And this is when things actually get hard. This is when you're not just solving the sort of tech problems that you can go out and buy things for, but you're solving much deeper cultural problems or much deeper data problems. Though still not Facebook problems. So the, the best example of this, I think, is this question of how much money do we make? Uh, this sounds simple and it sounds like something that every company should be able to say, they should be able to go in and be like, this is exactly how much we made yesterday, this is how, exactly how much we made two days before. Uh, in the real world, this is an impossible question to answer. Uh, it's, it sounds, again, simple, but take a basic company that's like a B2B company. You're selling something to another business, you've got a sales force and the sales force maintains their sales record in, in Salesforce. Uh, that data is human entered. So there's going to be errors in it. You have to deal with things like trial contracts that might be entered indifferently. You have to deal things with contracts of variable length. You have to deal with things like upsells and renewals. You have to deal with free accounts for nonprofits. You have to deal with free accounts for prospective customers. You have to deal with test accounts that you've created. Things like early cancellations, people who put in credit cards and the credit cards expire, people who put in credit cards and the credit cards never work. Uh, refunds, all of this stuff has to be managed in, in various CRM tools. It has to be managed in payment tools if you're using something like Stripe. And ultimately, all that has to mirror what's going on in your bank account. This never works. Uh, nobody's ever done this in a way that I've seen actually work. Um, it's always a really, really hard problem. It's a data engineering problem. It's you have data in a bunch of systems and you have to make them all match. It's an analytics problem. And this is the kind of stuff that, that companies really struggle with, is how do you answer this question? Again, sounds simple. 
I, I have no advice for how to do this. If anybody wants to go out and start a company or build some open source software to solve this problem, more power to you. Similar to that, uh, you run into this problem as well, where companies will have two tools reporting different values for the same metric. So say you're using Salesforce, you used to do your financial reporting in Salesforce, and then you've gone through a lot of these steps, you're like, no, we have a really great dashboard and a really great sort of analytical solution for how we want to do our financial reporting now. Those two things aren't going to match. Salesforce is somehow going to look different than the thing that you have in your database and the reporting that you've done. And this creates two real problems. First of all, it creates a problem where whoever it is that's consuming that data is going to trust what they saw in Salesforce and not trust what you gave them. They're going to trust the thing they saw first. That's always going to be their source of truth. It's not going to be the thing that's like, oh, trust me, this is the better one. They're going to want to know why it doesn't match the first one. And this is true if marketers were looking at Google Analytics and now they're changing to look at your version of, of that data. They're going to be like, well, Google Analytics says this. How come you can't say what Google Analytics says? If you don't have that trust, all of this other work doesn't matter. Uh, if you can't actually convince somebody that what you're giving them is correct, then, then you have to be, you're not going to be able to actually make any decisions or help people make any uh, changes in your company. So this is one of the things that I think that, that you have to be really careful about and you have to be very aware that this is going to happen and get out ahead of it. That, that when you're reporting on things, know that it's going to be different from what other people are seeing in other tools and be aware of that and help people understand why those differences are in place. Because if they don't understand it, they're just going to assume that you've done something wrong and then not ask you for anything else in the future. Another question that people run into uh, is we need real-time data. Uh, this is again a place where people will sometimes read medium posts. They'll see that real-time data is great. They want it. This is an easy problem. Masquerading is a hard problem. Don't do it. Uh, you don't need real-time data unless you're making real-time decisions. The only real-time decisions most companies really need to make are operational decisions about like, is our site up? Is our site down? Uh, you typically don't need to make real-time decisions about how our sales are doing this quarter. Uh, if you don't need to make real-time decisions about it, don't invest all the work to build any kind of real-time pipelines. Another problem that these companies have is they'll make a decision and they won't know why. Uh, somebody will come in, will have done something six months down the road, will ask a question that we sort of remember having asked before and have no idea why we made the decision then that we did. This is very much a cultural problem, but it's one a problem that like data engineering can help with a lot. Uh, Keeping track of what you've done, keeping track of ways that your, your analysis has been done before, keeping track of the data that you've used in the past, all of this stuff can be really valuable for helping you understand why you made past decisions. You're not going to remember it. You think you will, but you won't. Uh, and so being able, to, being able to go back and say, this is a record of, of some of the decisions we've made, some of the analysis that we've done before, can be super valuable. Uh, Airbnb, again, has done some stuff here to, to help out. Uh, they've open sourced a tool they call, I think, the Knowledge Repository. That's this kind of library of, or a methodology for recording analytical decisions and analytical work. That can be a really great kind of solution. This, again, it's much more of a cultural problem. How do you want to implement this, this way of remembering what you've done in the past uh, to, produce, to prevent yourself from replicating work and to prevent yourself from sort of wondering why you've done things that, that at one point you had a perfect answer for? This another problem that, that we hear all the time, this is like a painful problem that still is not solved, and again, if you want to go build a tool to solve it, great, we'll buy it, uh, is we need a list of email addresses. So marketing teams want to send a list of email addresses to some people that they're trying to, trying to market to. It'll be a list of email addresses that'll be things like they need to have visited a page three times, but they haven't signed up yet, and they've been to one event, and we haven't sent them an email in the last six months. And that ends up needing data from a bunch of different places. It needs data from perhaps your support software, of like we don't want people who we've sent a support email to. But you need also data from your production data, of like have they bought anything on the product yet? You need sales data. It needs this sort of big aggregation of data, and there's really no way to do it other than people manually writing queries and sending over like exports of email addresses to, to the marketing team to manually upload to some, some email marketing tool. Uh, email marketing tools will do this with individual systems, so tools like Marketo will integrate with your event tracking so you can say people who've been to this page but not this page but they never do it as completely as the marketing team will want they'll never do it as completely as your company should want and so you end up doing these sort of manual exports it's a huge pain it's a thing that takes a bunch of analytics a bunch of analysts time again particularly these companies that that don't have the sort of fully built out pipelines and haven't automated a lot of this um, and so 
this is something that, that again, if there were easy uh, sort of off-the-shelf solutions for, it'd be something that would be very popular among these kinds of companies. But as far as I know, there's, there's not a way to do this great aside from like engineering your own thing of connecting a bunch of APIs. Similar to that uh, is another problem of people wanting to push data into a bunch of different places. Uh, so say your support team is, is answering support tickets in Zendesk and they want to be able to know has that person been on a sales call recently? Uh, because that'll change the way that they, they actually interact with that ticket. Um, or you're, you're maybe A-B testing stuff and you don't want to actually A-B test people in trials because you think that may be disruptive for their trials as they're trying out your product. Uh, all of this requires you to move a bunch of data around into a bunch of systems. Some of them may be systems that you own, some of them may be third-party systems. This is a thing that, again, as far as I know, I haven't seen anything that solves this very well. Um, there are two reasons for that. One is technological, that you have to move data around into a bunch of different pipes, and that's pretty hard. The other one is that these tools think about things differently. What a user is in Salesforce is likely very different from what a user is in your tool versus what a user is in Zendesk versus what a user is in Stripe. Uh, and so there's not sort of any canonical mappings of all these things. And so companies spend a lot of time just trying to figure out how to manage these pipes and connect things, even though all the tools themselves are already kind of pre-built. Um, a place, again, if people, if people have companies or, or technology out there that really helps manage this, that's something that's a, this is a huge problem that, that again, I haven't seen good solutions for. Uh, the next last problem is a tricky one for a lot of folks, which is people want to explore data on their own. So folks will have built a lot of this infrastructure, they'll have analysts whose job it is to do analysis, uh, and then they'll get questions from their marketing team, their sales team, their operations team that, hey, how about we just do some of this analysis ourselves? We really like to do that and, and be able to self-serve. This is tricky not because the technology doesn't exist. So if you want to go out and buy Tableau and give people a way to do this, presuming that they can understand Tableau, which isn't as easy as it sounds, uh, you can solve this. You can give people a lot of access to data and, and they can go, go explore it. The, the part of this I think that's really tricky again is the cultural side, which is it sounds great to say everybody can, can be an analyst, everybody can explore data, but I was talking to a, a company recently that had done this and they had given people data to where people were logging into their website so the marketing team could see like where was their, their tool really popular. And they had location data and the location data was based on IP addresses because that's typically the way that you do it. And the marketing team found out that most of their customers were from Kansas and so they went out and made decisions based on that. The reason most of the customers were from Kansas is because if you have an IP address in the United States that doesn't match a location, it puts it in the center of the country, that's in Kansas, they're not actually in Kansas. <laughs> that there's no reason for them to know that. That's like understanding where that data came from, understanding that location data is based on IP addresses in this kind of weird way that IP addresses resolve to Kansas isn't something that the marketing team should be aware of. It's just something that's like you have to be deep in the data to get that. Um, and so that's like the job of an analyst, that's the job of a data engineer is to help people have that context. And so when you're thinking about, we want people to explore data, it's great and it sounds great in practice, but analytics isn't just about having the technology to do it or having the skills to be able to query data or, or, or make charts, it's about understanding what that data means. And so this is a, a big challenge for a lot of companies of figuring out where that line is of what is it that we open up to other people versus what is it that we require analysts to do so that we don't end up spending all of our marketing money in Kansas. Final problem uh, is I want to share data with customers. This is actually something we've started hearing a lot more recently. Um, that say you've got a company or a service and you've got customers who use that product. A question they'll often have is how much do we use it? Who's our, who are our most popular people? Who, who, what have we used it for recently? Who's logged in? Who hasn't logged in? Uh, this is something where people will be tempted to build sort of customer facing dashboards of if folks use Slack, for instance, Slack has this customer facing stats page to see how many messages you've sent. Um, these things can be nice, uh, they, can, they can be great for the products, they can be nightmares for, for data engineering teams because you have to, one, figure out how to build pipelines from, from your data warehouse and your internal tools into something that's production ready. Uh, and that's really hard. It means that now your ETL process has been productionized. It's turned into something that you have to like be maintaining a lot more closely, you have to have alerts set up for a lot more closely than you would if it's an internal tool that can be down for a couple hours and people will be upset but not that upset. Doing that that way is one solution. I've been involved in projects like that before. It's not a great thing to do. Uh, I would not recommend it. It becomes a pretty big pain pretty quickly. 
A second solution for this is there are tools that provide options for that. Uh, Mode, for instance, is a tool that does provide a solution here. There are other options that allow you to, to basically just embed things in your product directly, and that way you don't have to maintain pipelines. Um, there's a third option we've seen a lot more of, of people doing as well that's become popular, uh, which is taking your data and dumping it into a data warehouse for your customers. So your customer can say, hey, we want the, we want the sort of premium analytics package. We'll give you a Redshift database with all of your data in it, all of your logs in it, and you can do whatever you want with it. If you want to figure out how people are using it, go crazy, do your own analysis. Uh, this is pretty appealing. It's something that, that I think a lot of companies would be interested in. It's way harder to do than you would expect. Uh, we've seen a number of folks try to do this, have projects planned for it, folks that I would imagine would be very capable of doing this and very technically competent. There's not people who are doing something that, that's like beyond what their, their technical scope would be, and they've struggled with it. Uh, it's just run into a lot of pitfalls trying to do that. Again, if it's something where, where there were easy solutions for this, this is another place where there's an opportunity to solve a problem for a lot of folks, is help people manage sharing data with people outside of their company in ways that isn't just a dashboard, but is actually providing access to that raw data. So uh, to wrap up again, I think that, that the most important thing for me in thinking about this and sort of thinking about what are the problems that, that these companies face is that data engineering isn't just a technical challenge. Uh, it's not something that is, we just need a bunch of technology and then we solve all of our data engineering problems, we solve our analytics problems. The real challenge is, is it's cultural. It's making people being like use, making the data useful for people, making people actually want to use the data, making people understand what it is that they're looking at, uh, and bringing it to them in a way that, that they can actually find value in it. And so data engineering should be a mix of these things. It should be a mix of, of building technologies to help people solve these problems, as well as helping build cultures that, that make these problems things that, are, that are, people are actually asking to be solved. So uh, that's what I've got. I don't know. Are we doing questions? How does this work? All right, thank you, Ben. Uh, um, we have time for some questions. Um, yes, please. Oh. So, so this question is kind of a tangent, but I'm curious about the, the, the mode roadmap and how maybe it addresses some of these, uh, like, 22 um, challenges? Uh, we, so we primarily don't, we try not to get too involved in, in like the data engineering side of things. We primarily see ourselves as, as what happens after that. Um, a lot of the, in the sort of the last section of things about distributing data, about building, helping people build cultures, a lot of the things about understanding why you've made decisions in the past, that's places we very much see ourselves being useful. Uh, we don't want to, there's a lot of tools out there, as you can clearly see, that, that do a lot of the pipeline management. Uh, we don't, that's not, a, not something we have any interest in doing. Uh, but we really, we really want to think about more of the cultural side of, great, you have a tool now that, that can help people write queries, help people build dashboards, help people build reports. How do you make that a tool that is highly valuable both for analysts and the rest of the business? Uh, what are some of the problems that analysts run into when they really get into the weeds with that? Um, so again, a lot of that is understanding what they did in the past, understanding what things have changed since then. Uh, we, don't, we don't really, yeah, don't really have plans, again, to get into a lot of the weeds of data engineering stuff. It's a, a very well-served space. There are a few holes in it, uh, but I wouldn't expect us to build a, like, integrate your email mailing lists with mode kind of thing anytime soon. But you never know. I think, I think you mentioned that it's not a good idea for companies to focus on metrics. I was wondering what led you to that conclusion. It's, so I don't know that I would say it's not a good idea to focus on metrics. It's that a lot of companies will, when we, when we talk to companies at the early stage, a lot of folks will think that, that analytics is metrics. That the thing they need to do is they need to define exactly what it is that they're measuring. Like what is our, for SaaS companies for instance, what are these sort of SaaS metrics that you see people write about? We need to perfectly define those and then we can just plug stuff in and we'll be good to go. Um, I see analytics as being much more about helping you make decisions. And metrics can help you make decisions, and having sort of consistent ways of defining how you're, how you're counting things is, is very useful there. 
But in thinking about it is just a matter of like, if we have a dashboard with these five things, we'll be a smarter company. That's not really how, how it actually happens in practice. One, because those metrics, like I said, will evolve. Um, there are things that as your business changes, you may want to show different things. You may have like different ways of measuring the health of what you're doing. And two, because there's much deeper questions that go beyond that. We kind of have this phrase that, that a dashboard answers one question and asks three more. Um, and that's something that we see a lot with our customers is people will, people will put up a dashboard of their metrics and they immediately have questions of like, why did it go down? What happens, you know, oh, things looked great then and looked terrible here, now what? And, and metrics at that point don't become valuable. It's the questions you ask next that are the places where you really find the insight. So that's again not to say you shouldn't have some sort of core metrics to be looking at. Yeah, hi. So a lot of the solution you presented uh, seems to be very horizontal, like meaning hey, this is like one stack that will do you marketing, sales, customer data. Is, mm -hmm. Wouldn't there be more value maybe in having more like vertical solution than like one that's focused on sales, one on marketing? Or is that, uh, do you see a difference between those two? Uh, you, so we tend not to see folks do that partly because a lot of the tools that get built tend to get built in this horizontal way of, of like in these ETL tools, they, the way that a lot of folks build it isn't, we want to integrate with all of the marketing tools and that's it. It's, this is entirely speculation. I don't actually know where these people's, where these companies' roadmaps come from. Uh, but it's something where I imagine if they're, a lot of their customers and our approach too is, we want to have one tool for this. We know we're going to be pulling data from a marketing tool, from a sales tool, from a finance tool. We'd rather not have a bunch of solutions to solve all of that. We want like one tool to rule them all, which is a pipe dream for most cases. Like that's something that usually doesn't really exist. Um, the other thing is there's actually a lot of similarities between these that I think the vertical solutions don't really, it's, it's, the vertical solutions don't actually, aren't that different. Uh, that if you're working with Marketo versus Salesforce, those two tools actually don't differ all that much that you would need dedicated things. At the top of it, it might be different where if you're like, you have analytics tools that sit on top of that, there are analytics tools that are very dedicated towards sales analysis that are structured in such a way to provide insights and exactly like the kinds of questions you might be asking of sales. Uh, but at the sort of bottom layer, the similarities tend to be greater than the differences. So uh, a lot of what you showed uh, kind of like looks at, at the world as it exists today uh, within that like 99%. Uh, how, what do you guys see in terms of like the way that, like where things are moving to? Like is it gonna stay this way, say f uh, five years from now where like, where like you know, SQL should still be the the first class language, or or like are things are things shifting such that if you were thinking about starting a company to solve one of these problems, like y you need to think about how the ground might shift underneath you. I my take on that uh, is one there will be a lot of consolidation in this. Like this this the number of ETL tools out there that do very similar things. That's not a sustainable set of tools that are not that differentiated. Um, it's it's I think there'll be a lot of consolidation there, probably around some of the big players. AWS will probably consume some of these things. AWS is building services. They probably won't buy folks, but they'll just like eat out from what what those folks sell. Um, I think in terms of the technology, I mean, one of the trends that we've seen that's been interesting is when Mode first got started, which was a few years ago, we saw a lot of people wanting to do things on Impalas and Hives and Mongos and things like that. There has been a big push back in towards sort of more SQL friendly versions of that. Um, like BigQuery actually recently relaunched, the, recently in the last 18 months, I guess, launched a, a way to write more standard SQL on top of BigQuery rather than this kind of weird BigQuery-ish SQL. Um, that to us was like a, a pretty good indication of, of where the market wants to go, which is people don't want to learn these new things. SQL is a very widely adopted thing and it's probably not going away anytime soon. A lot of the popular stuff, again, is popular in part because of its dependence on SQL. Um, that said, I do think that like it the, the consolidation of some of these pieces is probably what you'll see where, where BigQuery itself might be able to pull in data from other services. Um, Redshift might, like the Redshift ecosystem, particularly in AWS, might become like this full stack where you can just push a bunch of buttons in the AWS console and all this stuff will suddenly start to work. Uh, but I wouldn't, I mean, we don't see any sign of like the technologies that people use 
the, the ways in which people want to interact with those technologies changing. The technologies probably are changing, but the ways in which people interact with them hasn't. But who knows, that could be, could be somebody in someone's garage somewhere who's making all this irrelevant.